Hi, this is Pierre Sabac, and we're going to be looking at the second part of Oriana's presentation. So we're going to be going in, into quantum physics and delving into what quantum is, and what quantum mechanics are, and we're going to look at the um, technical terminology, but this is going to be explained in layman's terms. So, over to Oriana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. So before a few um, traditional explanations that will be useful, like the so-called emptiness and so forth. I will just start by a good place to start, the alphabet, okay. where, where we can go from this. Um, the word alphabet, there's alpha and beta, right? Uh, here the subject is zero point, so the letter O we can identify as zero. And just for the information, in Sanskrit, zero is shunya like a shunyata, which is emptiness. So emptiness also refers to the suchness of zero, which is interesting. But for the letter A, we can simply see that it looks like a compass. The letter A has the potential to go out into 1D, 2D, and then springs to 3D. Of course, this is just a, a metaphor, but can represent the process of evolution, of expansion, compression, and then back to where it came from itself. From 0D, the point of origin, or 0 point, to 1D, linear, then 2D, circle, or forms, and then 3D, a torsion field. And here, as we will note, there is no such thing as time would be a fourth dimension. That is a total nonsense, because as quantum physicists themselves will show, time and space are the same thing, time space. Just in the same way that in geology, Pressure and temperature are exactly the same thing. For example, an amethyst, if it is under uh, Earth in a deeper level and with more pressure, then it will become a citrine. And this is why people who simply want to get more money, they will put it in an oven and in a few hours you get the equivalent of the same process, which would take thousands of years naturally through pressure. You heat them up, they heat them up, and they, it does the same thing. So the difficulty here is understanding oneself because like me for example when my hand is cold and I want to warm it up if I say well just press it that's not going to help but it works for the crystals so from the physics point of view pressure and temperature are the same thing they have the same effect likewise time and space are the same thing although they are for us perceived as slightly different but Time and space begin at the Big Bang, meaning the point where things come out of nowhere, so to speak, which we'll, we'll see what this nowhere is. So the letter A, alpha, represents the whole process of genesis and degenesis. And the letter B, interestingly enough, this is from a visual perspective as I'm talking, of course. The letter B, you see two round things. They represent a pulsation, they are the lobes of a sphere. Not of a circle, because this is not flat Earth vision, but in 3D, so think galaxy. Um, so we have actually, B is the, the heart beat of the cosmoverse. How do you say heart in German? Hertz. You add a T, it makes Hertz the frequency. So this beat, pulsation, is a pulsation embracing all things. It, is, it represents the heartbeat of the cosmoverse. And it can be related with the Schumann resonance, which is the heartbeat of the Earth. So this heartbeat is not in two moments, but in four. Expansion, stay, compression, rest. There are these four, which are very important to distinguish. And the most obvious example, example of that is in nature, spring, summer, autumn, autumn and season. So this A is like a compass. It goes from 0D to 3D, the genesis. And it's also a sound, a frequency. And it has an, an exact frequency in uh, Tibetan. The letter A, pronounced R, is represented, this is the letter R, so not A, the R, with a particular frequency. And it's the frequency of the zero point, actually, which it refers to. So in Sanskrit, the alphabet is called Ali Kali. Ali, the feminine ones, are the vowels, and Kali, are the consonants. So you note that R for the vowels and this famous letter K, which many languages in other ET realms, I've kind of studied a few of those that were available on the internet for those who know where to look. 
And a lot of them have this letter K as a, as a beginning, it has a, an importance. The Sanskrit alphabet has this too. So the vowels and consonants, in Tibetan you call it yang sel. Yang means the melodies, the sounds, and sel, the clarity, the light. So you have sound and light, which in physics, just like uh, temperature and uh, pressure, are the same thing, as we will show later. So the yang sel, the sounds, the, the tune or song or melody are the vowels, then the clarity are the consonants. And it's, we can put them in an interesting disposition in these alphabets, knowing that all letters have, by default, the sound R, and there's E, U, E, and O, which can be added on top or below the letters, but they have this uh, uh, pattern, you could say, uh, like a mandala. A mandala in Tibetan, kilkor, kil the center, kor the periphery. So mandala actually means pi, center and periphery. It refers to this disposition as well as the ratio that it represents. It is a fundamental ratio, which, as we will see, is indissociable from phi, cubit, and the meter, which is proved by the pyramid on the Great Pyramid of Giza. So the first letter, ka, in Tibetan, you have this notion of ka dak, which is one of the major practices in Dzogchen, Mahasandhi, great perfection, great completion, ka dak and lundrup, primordial purity and spontaneous presence, which we will detail later with a bit more background. The meaning will be more evident. These are the two main focal points of the practice. And A is melody or sound that is default to all. In Tibetan, you have the three versions of the letter A, the one that is default to all. Then there's a small letter A counted as a consonant, and there's a big letter A counted in the consonants. So you again have an interesting tripartition. And in Tibetan, this is just for the poking the fun, but the last letter, the last letters in the Tibetan alphabet are as ha and a. So just as much as alphabet in, uh, in our languages, which represent genesis and heartbeat of the whole thing, here I would call it simply the ha ha because it's the alphabet. So that was just for the alphabet. Now, this very, very important principle of empty full potential. This one seems difficult but as easy as anything. I shall invite you to, let's make a little field trip to Arizona. Okay. So there's a vast plain in front of us, blue sky, a few clouds here and there, a few cacti here and there. Just, yeah. And we're just standing a bit on a mountain, a mountain top, a little bit, and there's this vast plain in front of us. And we imagine a huge bowl, an empty bowl, that can be a meditation bowl, anything else. And we're standing there, it's miles in diameter, really wide. And I ask you, what is the suchness of what is empty? Well, that is the meaning of the word. It has nothing to do with the void, which is the 101 description of people who don't understand at all what it's about, as is explained in the traditional text. It is the suchness of what is empty. Shunyata, tonpani. It is the suchness of what is tonpa, or shunya, of what is zero. The suchness of zero. And the first thing I would think, if I have a empty bowl, oh, I can fill it with chocolate, I can fill it with gold, I can fill it with trash, with doctors, with anything, basically. The fact is, and remains, that whatever I can fill it with, the potential remains ever unchanged. If I fill it up with chocolates, the potential for this bowl of being full of gold remains unchanged. It is this empty, full potential. So this translation is empty, full potential, instead of emptiness, which is implied by the traditions of the insiders. I remind you that there's no such word as Buddhism. It's a word invented by you guys, which doesn't come from anywhere, doesn't mean a thing. It is. <coughs> In their language, it is called nangpa. Nang means inside, pa, the followers, the followers of those who look for the answers to the question of the universe inside. That's what the meaning of the word means. So if you call those guys Buddhists simply because one guy uh, at some point and you refer to that, it proves again that you have not ever heard a single real Buddhist teaching. So the suchness of what is empty, because of course it's the first thing you receive in these teachings, is the explanation of what these words mean. It's by nature, not something you can simply understand by yourself, unless you have yourself previous training or the understanding of your own nature, which is the only thing this is referring to. If you have that by yourself, then the meaning will be self-clear. Otherwise, it is kind of part of the thing that everybody will misunderstand, and it is a way of protecting the teaching, but it's not um, used for bad, for bad reasons. And by simply uh, leaving the words in a simple state in the whole literature is the way of um, naturally 
um, preserving the tradition, because of course the only the living beings are holders of knowledge. The books are just addenda, and they have lots of things which are mistakenly placed mistakenly, so that only those who know would know. So Tongpani, this empty full potential, this example was quite simple. Another example, I'm a grandmother. You didn't know that, I'm sure. If I'd had a daughter at 18, and she'd had a daughter at 18, I would be grandmother of sweet child of seven. So, call me granny. Potentially. The fact remains, I could be. Or, in another way, you're walking in the street, and then there's people going the other way, and then you go for something and accidentally someone trips on you, and the person turns and says, oh, you clumsy idiot. What is happening there? For that person, Defining you as a clumsy idiot is not wrong because at that moment you did something. Yeah, we all have our clumsy moments. That happens to everyone. So for her, qualifying you as a clumsy idiot makes full sense. But for you, when you are qualified for such thing, the first thing we feel is that that does not define the whole of my person. Yeah, okay, I'm going to risk myself there. But it does not define me. This empty full potential. When you're simply walking in the streets or doing nothing, if you're a musician, a scientist, an artist, that does not take away the fact that you have this skill. And yet, in a particular moment, you're not doing that particular thing. So this is an example how we can taste ourselves, relate to this full potential that we are as a living being, as a soul being, which is there all of the time. We simply do not pay attention because we don't even know that's something that we need to look for or to look at. Why? Because there's nothing to see. It is not visible. It is the empty full potential. Another example is... Look, there's a piece of paper here. There's lots of writing, all kinds of colours. What do we see? That's what we see. At any moment, does anyone think to consider the piece of paper underneath? Because, as far as I see, the piece of paper has the potential to practically have anything. It could be any language, it could be Tibetan or anything, it could be maths or not. The potential remains unchanged, even though what is manifest, it will, and it's its nature, will change all the time. And the simplest example to relate to it, is simply in your living room, you have a comfortable coat, sofa, and you have a light, a lamp post, with a light variator. So let's say your lamp is 1000 watts in potential. Let's say for one week you don't use it at all. Is the potential of 1000 watt changed? No, it doesn't, we couldn't care less. Let's say for the next week you use it all the time, full of. Does that diminish the full potential? No, at the end of the week it's still 1000 watt potentially. And then the third week, you use a little bit like this, and then not, and then a little bit that. What well, does that change the potential? Nothing whatsoever. The potential could not care less. It stays unchanged and unmodified whether or not something manifests. And likewise, when the variator is on the lowest level, on zero, it is not that there is no light. This is the debunking of the word darkness. There is no such thing. Darkness refers to the potential of light at its minimum. That's all it means. And when light can be more or less manifest, the potential remains undisturbed and unchanged. This is how we're going to slowly, slowly get into the what quantum mechanicians uh, talk about superposition and entanglement. Superposition means two things. Are in a, the thing is in a different state simultaneously. And in this empty full potential, likewise, the potential of 1000 watt remains unchanged whether or not you use it. And when you use it, when the light is there, there are different effects and qualities and properties of these light waves. But the potential could not care less. And both are simultaneous and non-exclusive. That's what we're going to continue to show a little later. So, this empty full potential that we are, potentially, we are infinite beings, infinite uh, potential, literally. And this... Um, Tradition brings methods, technical handbooks, of how to actualize, uh, to get back to the zero point, which is our point of origin, which is the answer to the question, where am I going, where do you come from? All of these things. So the suchness of what is empty is also the suchness of the zero point. A few numbers, just, this is not going to go very much at this point, because I'm going to quote Tesla and Einstein and a few others later. But just an interesting um, note on the number 16, which is a major number in the maths regarding this empty full potential. And 21 is also an important number in terms of the manifestations and the properties, different aspects of the properties it can have. But basically, this 16 is the major number. 
which is why the tradition of Dzogchen Upadesha Tantras, the uh, direct instructional class of great perfection tantras, are found as numbered as 17. What is 17? If you think pi, you have one in the middle and 16 around. That is how they fit together. Um, in the number 16, you also have twice eight, which is the number of the petals of the heart chakra, which we saw the other day on the map, the Shekhan is showing the map, pointing to the heart chakra, the center of which is where we need to go home. And to get to that, we need to break the cycle of existence completely. Not going up to the ET realm and then going back down, up and down. We said enough is enough. We want free of the whole cycle here. This is the difference between different uh, spiritual approaches. That are, The intention is certainly not to get nice experiences or to be in higher realms because as um, the quotation we mentioned last time reminds us, if you understand meditation but don't understand freedom, in what way are you different from one of these higher ETs in their little blissful realms? Because what comes up must come down, as David Adair cutely says in his little song, which I think we'll play a little later, for the fun of it, because it's very nice. So 16 has twice the eight petal disposition of the heart chakra, which is the Gouvernai, or the eight-pointed star, also represents the heart chakra. Mm, the number 108 is very important when you study the solar system, the distances between Earth, Moon, Sun, you'll find multiples of 108 all over the place. And it's a very interesting observation that uh, the Tibetans um, use what is called a mala, a rosary, to count mantras when you, when you practice Vajrayana practice. But the principle is that you should recite 100 or 1,000 or 100,000. And additionally, you always add 10% for just for those that you weren't really paying attention, that weren't properly finished. So you do whatever number is said in the practices, you always add 10%. So 100 plus 10%, that makes 110. Why are all the malas only 108 beads? Of course, there is a deeper meaning into that. The number 13, think pi, 1 and 12 around, you have again. But this is also uh, 1 and 6 and 6. And look what we can have with 1 and 6 and 6. This is, they call it a Metatron's cube, but you have all the primordial geometry in it. Everything is resumed. And you have like the circles, you have one in the middle, and then six around here, and then six around here. And within those, you can um, link all the dots, and you have all shall, these... Shall I just show that very close to the camera? Just do that. So, for the audience... There you are. I'm going to have to guess... Um, just keep that still. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, I'll just give you that back. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So just an example of with a simple number, all the things you can get, if they are simply put in the proper perspective, which of course must include geometry. There is simply no other way with geometry. Because they are the fundamental structures of everything, as has excellently proven David Wilcock, in particular in Ascension Mystery School, which I was following earlier this year, he has done an incredible job. And we are here simply going to bring the missing bits that Mr. Wilcock did not see. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the platonic solids. So this is why also the deep stack, as I just wanted to call them, the deep state, have their 13 bloodlines, because of course they could have a bit more. But they are using, as we saw the other day, the very symbol of, of G, the Freemasons, with the, the compass and everything else. It is because they have stolen the teachings of old, of course, through the occult and Atlantis, the occult meaning the holders of the wisdom of the union of the sun and moon, as we saw that sun and moon practice is the basic of everything, becoming the sun and moon disk, as a cushion on which all deities, widows are seated on because the I am, the ego, has dissolved. So all these people have stolen this information. Of course, maths is everywhere. So they steal the maths, but they don't understand it. Why? Because they're missing the main point. They're taking the heart out. Because as we will see, this thing of taking the heart out is precisely the little detail that our friend Tesla was missing all the time. As I will show later on his uh, a little documentary you find online, 369 with religion, about Tesla. It's lots of very interesting excerpts of his work pictured and mathemat mathematical, and he understood the importance of nine, and as we will see how three, six, and nine are the spirit, and the others are matter, and how he relates everything to that. But the nine, he forgot to, put, to think pi, that's one and eight, 
eight, eight branches of the heart chakra, meaning you yourself, if your perspective is not in the zero point, you, the observer, as we've seen in quantum physics, the observer depends, um, defines the creation of matter, and so forth. So he just failed to put that last bit together. And in Tibetan, you have the symbol you will find everywhere with a circle and three branches, like a yin yang, but divided into three. From this, you also get three, six, and nine. It's the symbol of Mercedes Benz, the symbol of Yamaha with the two forks. You can have you know, three things like that. And all of these refer to these important mathematics. In Tibetan, ga kil, ga is joy, and kil is swirling. So they call it the swirl of joy, and it also has fundamental principles, yellow, red, and blue, representing different aspects too. I won't go into too much detail for that. So that was just for a few numbers, and to show you that they can be used in very simple ways regarding our body, because our body, as we're going to see, is the machine, the perfect machine, self-made by nature. So numbers of machines go well together. Then the four modes of energy. Energy has four modes, or called tunes also. In Sanskrit, shantim, shanti, peaceful, yeah, mode of peaceful, like pacifying situation. Then, geba, pushtim, like to push, that's where the word to push comes from, to develop, to grow, to increase. It's an energy of increasing, which is a different level than from just shanti. And the third one, um, wangwa, vasham in Sanskrit, means power, caution, careful. Meaning, if the energy goes any further, things will become different. It's a very mesmerizing um, mode or tune. And the fourth one, Maria, Jampo, is to kill. Simple and clear, no discussion. So these are the four modes of the energies. Uh, of, we will see the primordial photon in the first place that then reverberates into all the later complexities. Just a little word more on last week, we saw the language of deities, anthropological, anthropomorphic language of deities, what they represent. And to come back to this, the empty full potential in the Tibetan et al. tradition, she is represented as female because it is the source from which everything comes. This empty full potential, as we saw with the light variator, it is the source from which the light comes. If there's no potential, then nothing can radiate or shine. So it is represented in a feminine form known as Tara, in Sanskrit, Jesundrona in Tibetan, which means the emancipator, the liberator, the savioress. And she's represented as a voluptuous and a splendid woman, bright green, a bit like hit this guy. So it's the peaceful aspect of empty full potential. Because the empty full potential itself has several moods, or several moods of mani manifestation. There's also, of course, the angry mood. And in the angry mood, she is called the great terror because she terrorizes literally everything. It's so much more terrorizing than anything we could ever conceive of, because it is the great terror of death. When the big crunch occurs, everybody is terrified, and everybody runs for their lives, but there's nowhere to go. You're going back to nature. Everything goes back in from whence it came. This is the biggest terror of all. And who is terrified? Who has a problem? Ego. This ego clinging, which, we, as we shall see in more detail, has no existence whatsoever, which is why it is creating the problem, including gravity, because it has no existence in reality. So we believe in something that is not there, which is what Shakyamuni calls making miracles, because one day a few people came to see him and said, look, okay, what you say is nice, yeah, we could believe you, but we'd like to believe you. Show us a miracle, and then we'll believe you. And show us something. And then he replied, Look, you guys, you're the only ones making miracles in the first place. You believe things that are not there to be there. I'm the only one who's not making a miracle here. Stop yours. That's what he replied to that. So the great terror, empty full potential, angry, is Mahakali Padanlamu, the glorious goddess, which actually means the glory of goddess. When the Christian expression, the glory of God, is actually the glory of goddess, because the nature, like the space, like the uterus, the womb, that gives... Uh, rise to anything at all. Maha Kali, Maha means great in the sense all encompassing. It means it refers to the nature, the only common denominator we all have as living beings is our nature. Because as for the rest, the detail, they are different and varied. 
And in the source equation, these are the two parts that make size test are missing, that they are simultaneous and non-exclusive, the absolute and the relative are together in one. And the relative has two aspects, which depend, of course, on the perspective of the observer, because this is what determines space-time, genesis, and all the rest in the first place, as we are going to see. And the practice of meditation simply is coming back home, whence the meaning of the word religion means that which link, links us back to our true nature. The meaning of the word is simply homecoming, coming back to the point of origin. And this dissolves any kinds of suffering and illusions, naturally. You have come back to your own source. Um, so in between, there's not just peaceful aspect and angry aspect, there's the semi-wrathful aspect. Both a little bit, you know, a little bit peaceful, a little bit both. This is the form of Vajrayogini, Dorje Neljorma, in Sanskrit and Tibetan. Vajrayogini means the indestructible uh, one who is united with the natural state. But that is um, kind of the name for, for common people, because she has a secret version, which is Vajravarahi, Dorje Pamu. Pak is a pig, Pamu, so she is the adamantine whore, the adamantine saw. What does this represent? This is language that talks to the mind. This is vagina context, so of course, questions of uh, penis and vagina will be all over the place, as we saw last time, even the explanation of the money mantra on money permission. And all the others almost refer to that. So here, Vajravarahi, the adamantine whore, because she can take it all, and it's the only thing that can. However, horrors, the immense things, pulsars, whatever the strength and the power of the horror that may occur in any one given place in space or time, the nature could not care less, stays unchanged. This is what is represented timelessly by the swastika. This is what it means. So, in the Tibetan tradition, you have, have it like this. Shall I just get that close to the camera? So, do you want to just try and describe what we're actually seeing there on camera? Okay. They look like thrones or some kind of uh, weapon. This is, of course, um, but that's not what, it, what counts here. This is representation of the indestructible ground of being of empty full potential. In its five colored lights, as we will see later, the energy of the primal photon is powered by five powerful lights. So this is simply, um, in Sanskrit, Vishva Vajra, Doje Gyajan in Tibetan, which means variegated, multiple Vajra. So I would call it the double dick, because we saw Vajra Pani means dick in his hand. Okay. So this symbol represents the indestructible ground. You see it on stamps, also from Mongolia, from centuries. But this is more commonly known as the swastika. And this is what it represents in all its variations of, um, uh, that, that you can see some with three, some with more. But it re represents this empty full potential, meaning that which is indestructible, for when the whole universe dissolves back after the big crunch, it is the only thing that remains. And it is indestructible precisely because it is not a thing, it is the potential. And this is exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to understand for the intellect, why? Because the intellect precisely is part of the second part of the equation if you refer to reality, your nature, with a dualistic detail of your potential, not understanding where you come from, then you simply cannot understand because this fragmentation is the problem. So this is why the practice of meditation on emptiness is described as the universal panacea, that which dissolves everything, traumas, uh, split personalities, suffering, ignorance, illusion, but also all the things that you like, meaning everything that is manifest. It dissolves everything. So it is a super healer. And it is exceedingly easy because the practice is simply not doing anything at all. The principle is non-interference, non-modification. Do not fidget with your nature. Nerja, as we explained, being uh, united with your nature. Meaning stop artificially creating something. Let the nature generally settle like the glass that is full of uh, muddy water, you let it settle, and then you see clearly. So it is exceedingly easy, in the sense that there is nothing to do, but it is exceedingly hard, in the sense that our habits, our tendency, and especially the belief in this ego, as if it really existed, is what is going to create resistances, as we will see later in the torsion field physics and the etymology in our language, which is simply all over the place, unbeknownst to anyone. And 
our language, if we only knew what the meaning of the words mean, like energy, intention, expression, all these, they're just talking about physics and mechanics. So peaceful, semi-angry and angry are the different forms of the same thing. It is represented also by the double tetrahedron, the Merkaba. It is the adamantine unification with Mother Nature. That's another way of translating it. Um, so the great black one, the Hakali, the angry form, the glory of goddess, was the protector of the Dalai Lama in particular. So it is simply a representation of this potential, which is the only indestructible thing. This potential, this nature, is actually the only thing we can ever trust. It is the only thing that will not light us, it is the only thing that will not leave us, that will not abandon us, that will not betray us, and that is always timelessly there, and that we'll never judge in this sense. So this is why this nature, emptiness, the empty full potential, is what we need to interest ourselves in, just like the iceberg. Our bodies and our beings, even our intellectual um, characters, are the tip of the iceberg, that which is manifest, meaning the potential, variator, the light, something is a bit manifest. But the whole potential is huge, and we do not pay attention. For as we will see, and as has been shown by torsion physics, as well as Dr. Lakisevich and others, awareness is a fundamental property of a torsion field in the singularity. So, if this awareness brings its attention, meaning its own self-natural energy, to itself, meaning looking at yourself, this is why the insiders call themselves the insiders. They look for the answers to the questions of the universe inside of themselves, and they have instructions, information on how to simply be, the art of being. So, a few words again on Dzogchen, and at some point I would like to give you the history life story of Garadoje, who is the initiator in this context, in this tradition which precedes Shakyamuni, although some texts will say opposite, it's because the timing and chronology is not simple, but between Garadoje and Padmasambhava there were 24 English masters, and um, Padmasambhava was the immediate re-embodiment of Shakyamuni, so we can know for sure that it was a little while before. Mahasandhi in Sanskrit, although these teachings have hardly been translated in Sanskrit at all, in one of the main Tantras, I think, the uh, Jatel Yud, which means the annihilation through sound, which is the root of the 17, which was due to be published this year by the Shangshan publications I was working with him last year. And this uh, text will quote black and white that Dzogchen teachings, after having been translated into 378 other languages before Tibetan. So that makes a certain number, and the language in which it was spoken is said to be um, Gagur Chogaiku. Get a bit mixed up because they're different versions, which means in brief the language of the birds, without reciting what kind of birds. But I'm sure it doesn't refer to the blue aliens, nor to the language of the birds used by the alchemists, which is again a, di a different um, circumstance and context. So here the teachings that I'm talking from the perspective is Rusel Dogje Nipo. We will sell lucid photons, living light, the indestructible heart. So it refers to not only the potential, but how we are going to be able to use the proper uh, properties of the primordial photon to blow out what is known as rainbow-like body, of which there are very many levels. And those that you know where people leave the hair and nails behind is the lesser rainbow body. It's for those who weren't even very good. Okay? The rainbow body itself of great transference, like Padmasambhava, Vimana, Metra, Chesun, the Great Lion, and many others, it is another level, and the body doesn't dissolve or anything. You are back one in total dissolution, and they can just flip out, flip out here and there, like um, some people know some other ATs can do, but it is not only that, of course, but there's one particularity, so there's no such thing as leaving the bodily remain behind with this realization. Which is unique. I'm also going to talk from the point of view of Mahamudra tradition. Of course, you cannot really talk about one without the other. Which is a very different way of talking. These, in this tradition, things will not be talked about clearly. The only thing you will be told about this empty full potential is that it's too close to be seen. That's why you don't see it. It's too close to you. It's too simple to be believed. We are complicated people. We think it must be really complex. This is so simple. It is too good to be true. This suffering we're in, it's too terrible. No, complete peace and happiness. No, no, it's not possible, we think. And more than anything else, it is too deep to be found. This um, um, glacier, uh, what's it, what's it, iceberg effect, 
that this nature is in the depth of what we are. And for so long as we simply do not pay attention to it, because we are busy focused on our, our physical aspects and it alone, we simply fail to see what is there all the time. So it is not difficult, but it is very difficult to do just that when we are used to doing anything but that. That's the difficulty in meditation. So Dzogchen will explain that energy is self-sustained, self-contained, timelessly complete as a whole, as a oneness. We are like a little fish in a little bowl all the time. Energy is complete. It cannot be more loving or less. It is a matter of the energy flowing properly. When the love, which is the energy, can manifest more healthily. And when we are blocked and crippled by all kinds of tortures, traumas, or negative actions that block ourselves, corrupt our own nature, then the energy simply cannot flow properly. And since this energy is awareness, then we simply do not have the leisure or freedom in our own perceptive being of understanding. It's not because we're stupid. It's because we're crippled up, basically. So this is where the practices of yoga and breathing come in. They straighten things up. You know the channels I showed you the other time? Yeah. They kind of tighten, stretches things because our channels are like spaghetti. They're all wound up by all the traumas we have and that are pushed down in the lower chakras and so forth. So this frees up the energy in the body. It blocks it, just like um, I'm going to say a plumber in, in the house when you have many corners and things and yeah. there's lots of blockages. Yeah. Likewise. And just to precise on that picture I showed you the other time when you had the guy with the three channels, you remember? I remember, yeah. Well, it's this... The sun and the moon. Yes, yeah. absolutely. What is important to understand is that this represents one or the other. You can never be at the same time, have a central channel and the two side, because they're not really channels. They are depictions of how the energy flows. Just like the chakras, people say, oh, these chakras, I'm working on these chakras. You have no idea. This representation is of how it could be, possibly, because they are pathways of experience. The spirit is the movement in the torsion field. And how they move is what our perception, our consciousness, is dependent on. Our consciousness is like riding the horse of the winds of mind. And this determines and creates our perception. So here, the question is, in, right now, we are in the channels of duality, the sun and moon, which you see everywhere. And when you are in dualistic channels, well, your energy is not in the central. So you see the central and the two on the side. It's to give an idea that you are either in the duality or through practice or direct recognition by itself of the nature of awareness. Your energy flows straight in a singular way, and then the mind is clear. It can finally get, taste, get it of what this is about. Because in the Dodge and lineage, it's not a lineage when you get many explanations. It's just like I compared it last time, like the Air Force style of people. You either get it or you don't. And those who get it, well, they, everything is for them. And those who don't, they will be told, look, go study elsewhere. This is exactly what happened to Milarepa, who is very well known in the West. But Many people don't know that the first teacher he ever encountered was a Dzogchen teacher. And as they usually do, they have a direct star. You either get it or you don't. And the first instruction Mirapa received when he was uh, he arrived, he said, okay, I'd like to learn with you and all that. He said, really, you want to learn? Okay. Well, this is my instruction. Do not do anything. Oh, Mirapa was very happy. Oh, that's nice. And he was in the field, you know, lying in the grass with a straw in the hand. Ah, oh, yeah. That's nice. Then the teacher said, look, I'm sorry, but you're just, you just don't get it. And I advise you to go and meet a teacher who's very famous for his anger, for his absurd, terribly absurd, destructive moods of anger. Uh, contrary to Drupa Kunle, who was more of the desirous energy, Marupa was the anger. And he said, go see him, it will work better for him. So this is a teaching, a practice, given to those who have already a certain maturity in what is the nature about, you know, uh, observe their own nature, the nature itself, one's own nature is the same thing, but who have this maturity and who can get to the point. Um, so the energy is self-sustained in the equation, you cannot have more or less, it's only a matter of using it this way or that, but it cannot be other than the full potential, and it's the full potential itself that manifests, it is not two different things, that is why in the equation of quantum physics, they are simultaneous and non-exclusive, but this is very difficult to understand by the intellect. And the second one has two parts depending on the perspective of the observer, which actually makes the whole difference. So ignorance, to come back to things like uh, darkness and light, darkness is simply 
the light in its sleep mode. Ignorance is likewise this full potential of full awareness, which is non-conceptual, as we defined it last time. Ignorance is in every moment that we go by, we do not acknowledge this self-power, for it is non-conceptual. And of course, those guys have made sure that you would never hear about these things, which is why when we sneeze, they will say, oh, bless you, bless you, because you're in danger, it's a vulnerability, then a demon could enter you. Oh, yeah, it could. It's called the demon of understanding the truth. You know, the demon of seeing your own nature and understanding that we are all timelessly free by nature, as we're going to see more intensively with the quotations of the tradition itself, in the words of Gerard Dodger himself, Wong Chen Pa, and others themselves directly. Um, awareness is timelessly free. You cannot entrap that which is not trappable. But if you do not know your nature, then you can be brought to believe that you could not be free. And this is how they are keeping you down, all of you, simply by keeping that information and the of others from you. That freedom is timeless and is everywhere. It is the nature of everything. Not necessary freedom in the elements. You can be in a prison that's not very free and so forth. But the nature could not care less. It's timelessly free. And if by learning and training in how your potential is, this blooms out from inside and sets things straight and as I say, heals the duality, the ignorance, the ego and all that by this simple practice. So ignorance is very important to understand um, that it refers to this self-awareness in its full potential simply not fully acknowledging itself, which is why it's called awareness, because it is self-aware. So if self-awareness does not acknowledge itself, well, exactly, you are leaving, letting the possibility of anything else to happen, including uh, someone who comes by there and says, oh, I want to exploit this one. Well, they can, because you have not authorized it in the sense that someone is authorizing something, as you see, well, there's no such thing as an ego anywhere. But you are authorizing in the sense that you are leaving the possibility open by yourself not fully acknowledging your own self-nature, which is, as we're going to see in the prime photon, it is one of the major properties of the photon, this self-awareness, which is why all things in the universe, in the cosmoverse, tend to commit singularity, like the black goo. In the discussion by Harold Coltsbella with Miles Johnson, he showed, he explained with the little pictures we can see the black goo. And he said if a scientist comes in a room with a black goo in a sealed container, and another one comes in with another one in a sealed container, suddenly, when they will acknowledge each other, they will be obsessed with one thing, uniting, because together we are strong. They have this intelligence, humor, or a little bit lacking that one at the moment. But machines, the same thing, you create a machine, they will all tend to try and commit singularity. Why? Why? It is simply because it is the fundamental property of the photon. Awareness is self-awareness. So another distinct, distinction to be made is, in, especially in this subject, but in all, of course, there is no text without context. As I mentioned before, if you talk about, let's say, Buddhist teachings, in some you will say, oh, respect your parents, be kind to them, and value their presence. In the continuums, the tantras, you will read, kill your mother, kill your father. And in Dzogchen, you will be told, there's no such thing. We don't have a mother and a father. So, if you talk about anyone who talks about Buddhism, if they don't quote the context, is there and then the very proof that they have never had a real teaching in their lives, and they don't know at all what they're talking about. So, there is no quotation, no citation outside of a particular context, because, context, because the information is given according to the listener. Just like in quantum physics, the observer determines the issue, the outcome. This subject is exactly likewise. We talk to people in a way that they individually can understand. Which is why people will find a lot of things confusing and not understand. Well, simply because of that. Because it was a particular context to that person who could not understand better. Knowing that for those who can, they will only be told one thing, like Midoriba. Do not do anything. And if you have this maturity there and then, you get everything. You understand. But if you don't, well, you'll need to have do a certain amount of yoga and all this, which is simply for those of lesser capacity. Like in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they forgot to quote the context. It is for those of lesser capacity, because there's no such thing in the context of Dzogchen. It is taken out of context, a little last piece of a whole opus, which is not even mentioned. So people who think they know Buddhism about that, that will go flying out the window right now. So ignorance is the absence of self-recognition of timeless awareness by itself. That's the definition of ignorance. It is not a thing, just like darkness is not a thing. Simply the absence of light. Just when 
you're in a room, let's say the light is on, then um, you turn it off, let's say, the light is off, and then suddenly you turn it back on, the lights come back, and then I ask you, where did the darkness go? Did it leave out through the window or the door? No, it didn't go away. The darkness was simply light, not manifest. Likewise, this ignorance thing, it's important to understand from the rest, is simply this self-awareness not potentially fully aware of its own nature, which is what it gives the strength to it. So a few words now on emotions. We're going to look a bit more into those. Emotion, ex motion, you are called a movement outside. Again, torsion field situation applies. We're going to see that in detail later. In Tibetan, you say nyomonga or dukna. Nyomonga are referred to as klesha in Sanskrit, but nyomong in Tibetan, the meaning is beautiful. Nyom means to listen, and mong means stupid. If you listen to them, they make you stupid. That's how you call emotions. Another word for them is pancha visha. Pancha means five. Visha, duk, means poison, venom, the five venoms. So, this is the explanations in the first and second categories of explanations, the context of Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana, but not in Dzogchen or Mahamudra, where they are known as Yishina, Panchajnana, the five primordial wisdoms, the five primordial wisdom energies, which is, of course, only perceptible when you have the zero-point perspective, because otherwise, when you're in duality, these very energies will actually uh, get us trapped in things that do not bring our, our best interest or our best benefit, which is why they are known as five poisons. Interestingly enough, as we saw last time, Visha, this sha in Sanskrit is an S with a dot underneath. If you drop the dot, it makes visa. So a visa card, card cardio, the heart, means a poison in the heart. And it comes from the Sanskrit, misspelt. So the five, if you listen to them, they make you stupid are the five um, wisdom powers of the prime pho photon corresponding to the, to the colors red, yellow, green, blue, and white slash purple. Knowing that um, some people find strange that green be a color in itself, knowing that it's um, the prime colors, it's a mixture of yellow and blue. But on the other hand, in the, in the presentation with these colors, it has a, a particular significance. And one should not forget, with all of the things we're gonna see today, it is a way of explaining. They are but metaphors. Even this torsion field thing, we don't have a real torsion field, but our energy behaves in this way. So it's not something that you should cling on, because otherwise with this interpretation and that, it will seem unclear. It is to try and intuit, to sense how these things work, but we must sense it by ourselves. So, the five wisdom energies are the five dances of timeless awareness. They are the five dresses of awareness. And here, it's important to know what they actually are. Ignorance, stupidity, is the main emotion. Stupidity is an emotion, which you guys don't really know about. Fear is not an emotion at all. It is the very property of the ego clinging, which does not exist. If there's no ego, fear cannot, cannot even happen. It does not exist. So, fear is the proof that you have a... Houston, we have a problem. The ego clinging, meaning you're not in the zero point. So it's a test one can see. If one's practice is deep, you gain what is called the four fearlessnesses. There are different states of fearlessness, which is technical. If you're in the right perspective, it cannot occur. Suffering cannot occur at all, other than through dualistic perception, through the ego. As one of the greatest Mahamudra teachers I was following uh, a while ago, he used to say, there is no such thing as suffering. There is only a sufferer. So, the five emotions, the emotion, when it's experienced dualistically as desire, is all discriminating awareness. Because if you think of this oneness, if this thing is hot one, how on earth can it even compare one thing and the next to even think about? So it's the capacity, it's the self-capacity of self-awareness to be able to pretend to be two things and compare itself, to be able to play with itself. And when you are dualistic, it becomes Ah, oh, this is nice. Oh, I want it. Or, oh, this is not nice. Oh, I want to wait for it. Then there's anger, mirror-like wisdom. It's intense clarity. It's the clarity aspect of awareness. Then there's pride, which is the intuitive wisdom of the unity, of the equality of all things. It's a very deep wisdom, but in duality, it's maybe one of the least manifest emotions because it's more subtle. People can keep it inside. Anger, not so much. Desire, not so much. But pride is more subtle. And in particular, people who have a tendency to intellectual studies and that is 
very much advised to keep an eye on that because it can become subtle and it blocks, it acts as a, as a duvet that prevents the light from seeing through. It blocks our perception also. Uh, in everyday life, it, it tends to protect us when people you know, put us down and so much. You know, it's this energy of leveling things. We know intuitively that everything's equal. No one's better or worse than anything else. But this is an important one to understand. Then, um, ignorance, stupidity, which is the white color, which is an emotion because it brings us out of the perspective of the zero point. This is the intuitive knowledge of the absolute expanse, of emptiness itself, which is why ignorance is very, very important to uh, study and learn about how it works, to be able to recognize it in oneself, because if you can treat ignorance directly, this is taking the problem by the balls, you would say, directly, by the root, by the trunk. It is the most powerful thing, because self-awareness is the nature and ignorance, it's this own self-awareness, not a joint agenda itself, is the major problem. So if you can relate with ignorance, it's just, you know, like, uh, you know, well, it's this natural knowing of the whole of space or something. This is an interesting aspect to see. And the fifth one is uh, lived as jealousy, envy, which is, um, the problem is duality. If we see someone who has something better that we would want because we like to do things, it's a pleasure to be able to do, to have a freedom, to be able to, to master things, to do things, compared to someone who's totally weak and battered and, and not free, right? So this envy comes because we see something that we want as ours, that we feel as our nature, but we see it as something else. This is unbearable, it's like being torn apart. This is how jealousy manifests as such. It's simply the dualistic perspective that makes things go wrong simply because of this ego clinging, because the energy in itself is all accomplishing wisdom. This is one of those, well, they're all very powerful, but uh, this is why um, jealousy, especially in women, is so strong, because it's a very powerful energy, because um, in the teachings of emptiness, again, empty full potential is the source of manifestation of everything. So women are the source of activity, action, and not passivity, as it could be thought of, which is represented by the double tetrahedron, known as Merkaba. So, as for these uh, situations, either five, if you listen to them, they make you stupid, or five poisons, or five wisdom energies, uh, the tradition has three ways of putting it, like um, respect your parents, kill your parents, no such thing. There is traditionally taught as pan gyur shi. Pan means to abandon, to give up, to let go. That is the Hinayana, the small minded people's approach. Those who take vows and all these things because they. You need something to rely on as a, as a crutch, which is very useful when indeed you have a broken leg. It is very much advice to use. So if you can't do better, you give up things. So people are tell, told to give up or to stay away from the five poisonous emotions. But of course we understand here you can't get away from the energy of nature, can you? So it's just a way of training oneself when one cannot have the intelligence to understand really what it's about. Then the second way is gyur. Is in, in Mahayana and Vajrayana it means to transform. The, Vajrayana tradition is represented symbolically as the peacock, you know, the beautiful feathers. The peacock is a bird that can eat a particular seed that for all the other kind of birds is poison. And it alone probably has a, its digestive tract can manage that seed. For all others it's poison. That's why they take it as a symbol. They say that maybe it's because of eating that poison that gives them all these beautiful colors on their feathers. Not necessarily true, but it's a way of saying that in Vajrayana, all these things which are poisonous, they listen, you can listen to them, they make you stupid for others, for a Vajrayana practitioner, because you have the intelligence of the nature, the self-nature, and uh, good training in non-ego, that is the basis for Vajrayana practice, then you use what is otherwise poisonous, which is why all the tantric rituals and all that, the practices of deities, of Mani Padmehum, Vajrayana taking his hand, all the others, the only purpose is to make you have problems, to make things come up, emotions, because when they come up, then you can deal with them, and you can get deeper, into your understanding, into your realization of the empty full potential. So this is how they use things. And again, if you can't do better, you're told, look, stay away, take mark, take vows, you know, because then you can settle, things can settle, you can see clearly. So again, it depends exclusively on the capacity, the maturity, meaning the high enough vibration, as we call it nowadays, of the listener. And then the third uh, perspective for Mahamudra and Jokchen is shi, means jnya, means no, directly. When this energy rises in our experience, perception, the instant it's there, your gaze faces inwards, and it should be, it was all the time, but in case you forget or you are training, and right there and then you see the nature 
you look at the empty full potential, this energy that is arising, let's say desire, someone, you know, it can happen, or anything else, jealousy or anger, something that provokes you, you just self-acknowledge the nature of what is going on. This is not different from awareness, from the nature of awareness. And you stay in that, and you do not let yourself be taken out, moved out, emotion, and you stay in the nature, this underlying stratum of lucidity, of knowingness. The knowingness of what we are does not change. When we see something, we are seeing something. When we hear something, the form of the perception is different, but it's still we uh, perceiving something. This perception itself, cognizance itself, you stay in the self-acknowledgement, like under the glacier, the nature. And you will see if you observe simply that, without participating in your emotion, that is the secret. Zero plus and minus, uh, um, attraction and repulsion. Don't go into it and don't shun away from it. Something nice happens to you, the practice is simply, you go through it. But you don't cling to it, you know, ah, oh, it's nice. So then you get trapped. And when something unpleasant, when you're being traumatized, done horrible things to, don't try and shun away from it. You know that awareness, staying with awareness, is the only thing that will get you through. You stay in the nature, it will not be particularly nice, necessarily, but it's just things that are impermanent, that change, that are not nice. The nature could not care less. So the training consists in staying equal in all situations, not in getting this, not in getting this or that. Um, the practice is simply to be able to not participate in the movements of thoughts, of emotions, and so forth. Because if you do not participate in them, you are imperturbable in your nature, in the natural place of rest, and they do just that. The energies move, and no one gets hurt, no problems happen, and it does not crystallize, there is no ego, and you do not, in consequence, do this or that to other people. You rest in the nature, this is the whole principle of awareness. And the, the whole path is shown by Shakyamuni and the others. So again, these three ways of practicing uh, concern three types of people. Mempa, Barma and Rab. Mempa, these of, those of inferior acumen, inferior capacity. It's not an insult, it's just an energy level, radio vibration thing, that is simply not big enough. So they cannot technically, so it is just kindness out of, for them. If you have a broken leg, you go to the pharmacy, they'll give you a crutch. If you have a migraine, they'll give you something else for the headache. So the tool, the remedy, must be adapted to the capacity of the person. Then barma, the inter intermediary or mediocre, mediocre capacity. Um, there are different levels of that. And then rab, those of high, high acumen capacity, only those people can access Vajrayana teachings because it refers to already an understanding that awareness, consciousness, is at the basis of everything, mind, matter, and the rest. But a, a, an intuitive understanding, it doesn't need to be intellectual or anything, but an intuitive uh, relationship, the fact that you can relate with your nature itself at all. And in the context of Jocelyn, is for the very best, for those who get it. And also, this is also explained in the, in the Tantras, at the same time, Tautina Mahamudra are for those of the very highest acumen, you can tell directly, at the same time, it is said that at the end of times, when the degenerate ages are just so bad, people don't have the possibility either to take monks' vows. I mean, uh, nowadays, how would you take monks' vows? And even the Mahayana, I mean, it's uh, where we go one, we go all, all these kind of attitudes which take a, a certain amount of time. And the Vajrayana practice, you need um, all this paraphernalia, this, this conditions to be retreat. We can't. We are overbearing. It is said also to be that the last thing that will remain that people will be able to get because there's no possibility to get anything else. This is also why I'm um, like, um, placing it here because it has this uh, dual use and explained as such. So we have emotions and the fact that um, participating in what occurs in our mind stream is what creates the problem. The word attachment, attachment, what does it mean? Ah, no, touch, like tachymeter in the car, that which measures the speed. So attach means no speed. What is this no speed? Why do we get attached to things? Because it is our intuitive knowledge, but having forgotten the zero point feeling, that we feel that um, when we are not in a state of energy or effort, that it is more comfortable. Attachment, we are trying intuitively to find the situation of no speed, which the genuine pos position is that of the zero point. But when we're um, lost in duality at all, and conceiving that we really exist, that this is a real table, and we're going somewhere, and ascending and all that. We're simply trying intuitively, but with lack of full understanding. So this is simply to show that everything we do, all our worst aspects, if we were to call them bad in the first place, 
are simply natural intuitive wisdom that we do not know what it is actually doing, what is actually happening. Because those guys have taken this information as far as they could away from you. So attachment acts like the anchor in the torsion field situation with our mind, being the movement, matter being the crystallization thereof. This attachment acts as an anchor to keep it together, to try and keep one's coherence, which is otherwise broken through tra trauma. We're going to see how trauma actually works. And it is also uh, Stockholm Syndrome and all these things are a deep intelligence of ours for self-preservation, simply because we are not able to have more energy to understand properly which will free us. So all of these things in psychology are natural, healthy, based on a basic goodness. It's just that we simply fail to misunderstand the point for lacking the proper point of perspective. As so the problem is that which requires effort. And to finish on ignorance, Ignorance or non-recognition is moment by moment because, as we're going to see later, the point of origin of the whole cosmos, this is going to be very shocking and totally unacceptable for any physicist, and we're going to prove it slowly, slowly. The point of origin of all existence is every t equals zero that goes by in every last one of us, which is also which explains um, what Tesla can see, why he defines the nine as being the only linear number when the others change and so forth, because he was simply missing this point. The point of origin is every now that goes by. The rest seems to appear and move, but this has never changed, this potential that couldn't care less in its own way. So this is how you get free, you get self-empowerment and self-freedom moment by moment. If you miss, now you know that awareness is the nature, and you miss the point, well, you just missed the bus. And when is the next one coming? Well, right now. And right now. And right now. So, timelessly, it's not, not necessary, you know, to mea culpa, you know, to feel guilty or anything. No, that is totally unnecessary. The point is to understand that freedom is something you can get right now, right now, if you want. And if you miss the point, it's okay. You are learning. So, it's all good. So, to de-stress about that, non-recognition, moment by moment, is the so-called authorization we give to others to exploit us, simply by leaving this possibility open, literally. It means that it is possible. And how? Simply by not being fully, fully self-aware, since this is our nature. If you do not use it, someone else will use you. This is what it comes down to. So you have to take it back, here and now, and this is what is called being self-empowered, because self-awareness. And if you want, we can make a little pause and continue just after this. Well, thank you very much. That was absolutely mind-blowing. So thank you. I was just listening intently to every word. I was really you know, stupefied in terms of just all that information. And I think it really shows that you really intensely studied the text. And it's amazing how you can actually draw these comparisons and these correlations between the uh, uh, Tibetan and the Sanskrit traditions and how this actually relates to quantum physics uh, to zero point. And uh, I'm still trying to get my mind around this, but it's absolutely amazing. So I'm really looking forward to the um, second part. So thank you very much for listening and we will continue this uh, discussion very shortly. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.